Fort Collins Seventh day Adventist Church. It's a privilege for me to be a part of your worship service. Your good friend Daniel had asked me to be a part of this, and so thank you for the opportunity to speak. I always enjoy going to your church and mingling with my friends there at the church, and I trust that you all have been healthy and spiritually strong during this coronavirus. I trust and I pray that God's grace has been upon you all, and I have no doubt in my mind that the God who shines upon us has shined upon you through this time. And so I praise God for his providence and his protection. The title for this morning's teaching is Made in His Image. Made in His Image. What qualities do you appreciate in your significant other or your spouse? Well, I know what qualities I appreciate in my wife, my spouse, Catherine. In fact, some of the qualities are alluded to in the vow that I wrote her for our wedding. It was actually a song. I'll spare you from singing it, but let me read to you the uh, two verses. I wrote, I, Nestor, take you to be my wife, my one true love, my partner, and my friend. Before our family and friends and our Lord God today, I vow to you, I'll cherish you always. And so what are qualities that I appreciate in Catherine? She is a partner. She is my friend. And then in the second verse, I love when you open your heart and soul and even when you choose to tickle me. And if we're blessed with silver hair, I'll still think you're lovely. I vow to you, as long as we shall live, I vow to you that I will always love you. And so here it is, right here. She, I'm, I'm able to open my heart and my soul to Catherine. Uh, sometimes she tickles me and she sneaks up and, and surprises me. She tries to scare me at times. We have fun in our home. And I believe that God has blessed me with not only uh, a beautiful wife inside, but a beautiful wife on the outside. So those are my wife's qualities. Qualities I appreciate in my spouse. Now what about me? I'm a man. Now I don't mean to brag, but I'm a man and I know that I have great cleaning abilities. In fact, someone wrote this. A husband is someone who, after taking the trash out, gives the impression that he just cleaned the whole house. Ah, oh, friends, I, I do the same. I brag on myself a little bit too much. Now, what qualities has God given you? What qualities has God given me? What qualities has God given humanity? That's what we're going to try to figure out in this morning's teaching. We're going to learn about two qualities that God has given us today that if we realize and embrace will make a, an eternal difference in our lives, a temporal and eternal difference in our lives. Qualities, two qualities that you're not going to want to miss this morning. Let's pray before we dive into the word. Father, here we are, your people, trying to figure out what qualities have you given us? What qualities have you bestowed upon us? Would you please teach us? Would you please reveal that to us? In the name of Jesus, amen. So I invite you to turn with me to the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter one. You know, every start of a new year, we seem to change the subject of Genesis chapter one, verse one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And sometimes, we insert in the beginning, I create, I create. I'm the one who's the creator of my, my life. And it starts in the, the beginning of a new year, January, February, March, April, May. Now we, are, now we are in May and we think to ourselves, what new goal can I initiate? What new habit can I create? What new initiative can I take on? What new project can I fulfill? we begin to take upon ourselves the ability to create as if we are the ones who are primarily and ultimately in charge of our lives. But friends, before 
we get caught in this trap of thinking that we are the creators of our lives, let's remember that we were created because Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 says this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God is, not our, God is our creator. We are not our, our own creators. God is our creators. Now, how does God create? What means, what method does God use to create? Well, notice what the Bible says here now in verse 3. Genesis chapter 1 verse 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. So what does God do? He says something. He speaks things into existence. Light, let there be light. And guess what? There was light. Jump down to verse 6. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. God spoke, and what happened? It came, into an ex- it came into existence, verse 9. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God spoke, it came into existence, verse 11. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit, and which is their seed, each according to its kind, on the earth. And it was so. God spoke. And vegetation came into existence. Verse 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God spoke, and the lights came into existence. Verse 20, and God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. Verse 21, So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind and God saw it was good. God spoke. They came into existence. Verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds and it was so. God spoke and land animals came into existence. You see, friends, God speaks and things come into existence. Psalm 33, verses 6 and 9 says this, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, for he spoke and it came to be. God speaks and things come into existence. And so I have a question for you. If you knew that God's word can change your heart, And he has the ability, just from his voice, to bring spiritual life into existence? How much time would you spend in his word? How much time would you spend listening to his voice? You know, this year, I've chosen to journey through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I've been reading the Bible every year for several years And now I'm reading from the beginning to the end, Genesis to Revelation. Because I know that unless I let God's word voice speak to me, I won't have spiritual life. My wife, Catherine, has chosen this year. Last year, she decided to read the, the entire New Testament. Now she's reading the entire Old Testament because she realizes that the word of God speaks life into her heart and soul. I'm sure there are Many leaders in your church, members in your church, people in your community who have decided, you know, I'm going to read the word and, 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 and maybe, maybe you have, you, you, you're not reading through the entire Bible, but you've decided in your heart, I'm going to read the word every single day. I'm going to read the Bible regularly because I need God's voice to speak to me. Friends, I want to encourage you, let God's word speak life to you. Perhaps you have lost a loved one recently. Let God's word speak to your heart. Revelation 21 verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Perhaps you have been fearful during this coronavirus season. God's word says in Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6. 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Maybe you've been struggling with bad habits. Philippians chapter four, verse 13 says this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Maybe you've been weary, tired, and exhausted. Jesus says in Matthew 11, verse 28, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Perhaps you've left God and you want to come back. Jeremiah 24, verse seven, I will give them a heart to know that I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord and they shall be my people and I will be their God for they shall return, return to me with their whole heart. He will actually put within you a heart for God. He will place that within you. Let God's word speak life to you. God is our creator. He speaks and things come into existence. He spoke light and there was light. Sky and there was sky. Plants, there were plants. Animals, animals came into existence. But we left one verse out. I want you to notice the crowning act of his creation. Notice, now Genesis 1, verse 26. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Jump down to verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God made us in his own image. We resemble the creator. No other animal looks like God. Only human beings. We resemble the creator. When God looks at us, he sees a reflection of himself. He doesn't see it in any other, any other part of his creation. No animal, nor veg no vegetation, nothing only in his created human beings. And so friends, since we are created in his image and we resemble the creator, what qualities do we have? There are two qualities that we are going to learn about and find out from this passage. Number one, we are valuable. Number one, we are valuable. If we are made in God's image, and God is infinitely valuable, then we are worth more than all the gold and riches in the world. Let me repeat that. If we are made in God's image and God is infinitely valuable, then we are infinitely valuable. Notice what Ellen White says in Lifting Him Up, page 48. She says this, Man was the crowning act of the creation of God, made in the image of God, and designed to be a counterpart of God. But Satan has labored to obliter uh, obliterate the image of God in man and to imprint upon him his own image. Man is very dear to God because he was formed in his own image. That's why we're so endeared to God. We're so endeared to him because we were made in his own image. You know, during the creation week, he spoke things into existence, right? Let there be light, there was light. Let there be animals, there were animals, right? But notice how God forms man. Genesis chapter two, verse seven. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature. While God speaks everything else into existence, what does God do? God's get, God gets down onto his knees and he forms and he fashions man with his very own hands. He doesn't just say, let there be humans. He actually gets down onto his knees and he forms us with his very own hands. Here at Campion Church, we're almost done with our, our building addition. And uh, I've had the privilege of uh, working on our construction site on numerous occasions. Our, uh, one of our elders, Kim, Kim Mellenbacher, a contractor and has, has uh, in my books, he's a hero uh, because he's been seeing us through this whole process and this whole project. He gave me the privilege of working on this building. And friends, uh, I don't have a lot of carpentry experience. I'll, let me just be honest and frank. But you know what? Even though I didn't know what I was doing, Kim gave me the joy of working with my very own hands. I mean, it feels 
special to know that I played a part in building the building right next door. God didn't just speak you into existence, friend. He got down into his knees. He used his very own hands and he got into the dirt and he, he, he molded our face and our hands and our eyes and he found great joy in creating you. You know, there was one uh, speaker, actually a rapper, just came back, came to Christ at a conference appearance, Passion 2015, five years ago. Lecrae, this rapper, told the story of a recent trip to Hollywood during which he stopped into a department store to buy a t-shirt. Not a fancy silk or diamond studded shirt, just a plain cotton t-shirt. As he pulled one from the rack, he noticed the price tag and thought to himself that it must be mismarked. So he pulled another only to find the same price on the tag. Incredulous, he approached the salesperson to question the exorbitant price. $640? Are you serious? For a plain t-shirt? The salesperson looked at him and, 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 and told him, yes, it is correct. $640 was the special sale price. You've got to be kidding me. He began to question what could possibly be so special about this t-shirt to warrant such a value. He asked, am I going to be healed of some disease when I put this on? Come on. Am I going to get some kind of superpower? And the store rep said this. Please listen. He said, it's the designer's name on it that adds value to it, she replied. Friends, you are valuable because God's name is on you. He formed you. He fashioned you. He put his name on you. You are made in his image. Therefore, you have infinite worth. You know, in today's culture, where do we we derive our sense of worth and our value? Our sense of value is extrinsic. In other words, your value comes from something outside of yourself. Your value is based on performance. I'm more valuable if I work hard and and succeed and am promoted at work. Or I'm more valuable if I get more compliments for my good looks. I'm more valuable if I have the best grades in school. And friends, there's nothing wrong with getting good grades and, and being valedictorian of your class. But when your value is attached to your performance and and uh, you are to fail, what happens? You feel like a failure. In our culture, value is derived from extrinsic worth. But since I'm made in God's image, because he fashioned me even before I existed, he was the one fashioning me in my mother's womb. He was the one who fashioned and, and formed Adam and Eve. Since I am made in God's image, my worth is not extrinsic. My worth, my value is intrinsic. I do not have to seek validation and and approval from other people. Although I am a broken sinner, I am still valuable because I resemble the very image of God. And since I'm already valuable, since I'm made in God's image, I'm not crushed if I don't get a promotion at work. I'm not defeated if I don't get the top GPA in school. I don't have to fish for compliments and look for attention. I don't have to be better, smarter, or faster than anyone else to be happy. In fact, I don't find my worth from, my ultimate worth from another human being. Because my my worth is derived from my intrinsic value that God has placed upon me because I am made in his very own image. You know, there are some people who worry about their past. They let their past mistakes determine their worth. I think about the woman in John chapter 8, the woman who was caught in adultery. You know the story? Caught in the very act, dragged out by her accusers. They dragged her in front of Jesus. What are you going to do? The law says you're supposed to stone her. Jesus quietly looked at them. He did not condemn this woman. But you know what Jesus did? Jesus did look past her mistakes. Jesus saw her as a child of God. And he said, where are your accusers? They all left. 
go and sin no more. What he communicated to that woman is this. He said, woman, you've been caught in the very act and you know, I don't have to tell you, but you feel broken and guilty for what you have done. But I don't look at you as a broken vessel. What I see is my very image upon you. You have infinite worth. So go. Don't repeat the same mistakes. Live with the reality that you are made in my image. That you have infinite value and worth. And so friend, if you're struggling with Wow, I just can't get past over how I used to live, the mistakes I've made before. I can't get over my past. You don't have to live with the past. You can live with the realization today that you are made in God's image, and with that realization comes infinite value and worth and security and peace. Your past does not determine your worth. You are valuable because you are a child of God. Even when you're in the midst of of, of, of a cycle of sin and habits and mistakes. You are a child of God. So quality number one, we are valuable. Quality number two, we have self-control. Notice back in the text, Genesis chapter one, now verse 26. Come back to verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And here's the second part. And let them have dominion. There's the key word. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. What does the word dominion mean? The word dominion means to rule. As God rules the universe, he gives to mankind the authority to rule over all the creatures of the earth. He gave that to Adam and to Eve. But you know, there's a problem. Man has a dire problem. While man can rule animals, he has a hard time ruling himself. And friend, you don't have to look very far to corroborate the statement. You don't even have to look at the TV to realize that man can't rule himself. All you have to do is look in the mirror and realize that yes, I can't rule myself. I am broken. You see, friend, we were made in God's image. But Adam and Eve, they marred God's image when they sinned. God gave them dominion and rule over all the animals. But what does Satan do? He comes disguised as a serpent and he deceives Adam and Eve. And he says, come on, Adam, come on, Eve. Eat the fruit. Come on. You're going to be like God. You'll have you will have more than just the image of God. You will be God yourselves, Adam. You will be God yourself, Eve. And so Adam and Eve struggled with this temptation. Should we follow God or should we follow this, this, uh, this, this serpent? We don't know if he's telling the truth. And so they wavered back and forth. They struggled with this temptation. They struggled with the decision. And finally, Adam and Eve, they picked up that, they picked up that fruit and they ate it. <laughs> And right then and there, they destroyed God's perfect image and separated themselves from God. You see, Adam and Eve, they controlled the animals, but Adam and Eve could not control and have dominion over themselves. And it was at that point that mankind lost the ability to rule themselves. And friend, you don't have to go very far to see this trait passed on to, gener to the next generation. When you look at Cain and Abel, their children, what, is, what happens? Cain and Abel are supposed to bring a sacrifice. You know Cain brought the wrong sacrifice. Abel brought the right sacrifice. Cain got jealous because God accepted Abel's but not his. And what did he do? He could not rule himself. He got angry and upset and was jealous. And what did he do? He killed his, his very own brother. Man lost the ability to rule himself. Cain was supposed to rule over sin. Genesis chapter 4 verse 7 says this. If you do well, you will, will you not be accepted? And if you, do, if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, Cain. This is God speaking to Cain. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Come on, Cain. 
rule over that desire, but he couldn't. He killed his brother. And we see this pattern throughout the whole Old Testament. And friends, we don't have to look very far to know that we can't control ourselves. Adam and Eve lost the ability to rule themselves. So what would God do? What would be the solution? God would send a deliverer to punish the serpent. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. What is this talking about? It's speaking about a future deliverer who would crush the serpent's head. God's speaking to the serpent. Your head is going to be crushed one day. This deliverer would crush the serpent's head and reestablish his dominion and his rulership and his authority. What's the point? The Redeemer redeems us from sin and he restores our ability, our, our ability to control ourselves. So friend, don't be fooled by thinking to yourself, I'm the one who's in charge of my life that I can pick, up my, pick myself up by my own bootstraps, bootstraps and somehow control my life and rule and, and have dominion over my life. The reality is that if you, look at the, if you look at TV, look in the mirror, you look at your own heart, you realize that you can't. And so the only solution is if someone, this Redeemer would come to redeem us from this problem, re redeem us from the penalty and the power of sin, and give us the ability to have dominion over ourselves, to rule over ourselves. The only way that we can rule over ourselves is by believing the one who rules this world. The only way we can have self-control is by trusting the one who is in control. The only way we can rule over sin is by surrendering our lives to the one who has conquered sin. It is impossible for you, it is impossible for me to control myself in my own strength. The natural man cannot fight this temptation, so why are you trying to do so? Friends, we need supernatural help. And you know, I searched and searched for an illustration to illustrate this point. And, uh, I found something that works. So here's the illustration. So uh, now you'll notice that uh, this is a glove, right? This is a glove. And uh, I'm going to put it right here so you can see it, right on the screen. Okay? It's a work glove, and you can tell that it's a work glove. Uh, I use this here to help build our building and also to, uh, to pull out weeds and to garden, and so you can tell it's dirty. All right? It's a work glove. And a work glove is designed to do work. And so, let's try something, okay? Let's try something. Let's put the Bible right here. And let's tell the glove. Okay, glove? Pick up that Bible. Come on, glove. I know you can do it. Pick up that Bible. Can't do it. Maybe the glove needs some inspiration. Glove, I know you can do it. I believe in you. Come on, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so, so just trust Jesus enough and you can do it. I believe in you. Pick up that Bible. All right, can't pick up that Bible. Maybe this glove needs some training, discipleship training, evangelism training. Let's train, let's train this, this, this uh, glove to work. Okay, come on. Come through an a, a afternoon seminar. Come on, read more books. You need some more training to pick up that Bible. Can't do it. You know what? Maybe this glove needs more fellowship. We need to surround this glove with an accountability, accountability partner and with other, other gloves because he needs, this glove needs a sense of community, right? It needs community in order to pick up that Bible. Okay, that doesn't work. Or maybe we can, we can appeal to the glove and, 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 uh, and, and, and call it to make a commitment. Come on, glove, surrender all, commit, decide today, recommit your life to God and you'll be able to pick up that glove. <laughs> Friend, you get the point. This glove cannot do any work on its own. The glove can't do any work until a living hand enters it and does its work through the glove. That's the only way. Friend, it's impossible for you to control yourself. 
we lost that ability in the Garden of Eden. But here's the reality. A redeemer came, a deliverer came, and his name was Jesus Christ. When his living hand comes in you, he will work in you to do his good pleasure. And so friend, you are valuable, number one. And number two, in Christ, as long as Jesus is in you, you have self-control, you have dominion, you can rule over yourself. So will you allow Jesus to come into your life? You know, 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 says this, little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is, who he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Jesus is the one who is greater, and he is the one who can work in you to accomplish his good pleasure. What are the characteristics that God has given us? What, is he has, what has he bestowed upon you and upon me? One, he has given us value, infinite value. Number two, in Jesus, we have self-control. We have dominion. And we can rule over ourselves. And so what if we lived, this real- what if we lived with this reality the rest of this year? What if during this coronavirus season when everyone around us is fearful, everyone is wearing a mask, that we live this reality? And we said, I'm going to live with the reality that I, have, that I have infinite worth in God's sight, that I'm not going to worry about what other people think. My value is not found by my, my performance or what other people think about me. My value is found in God and in God alone and the fact that I am made in his image. And what if we live this, with this reality that, that as long as we are connected to Christ, that as long as the living hand is living through us, that we can have self-control and that we can rule over our lives, that we can have dominion over our inclinations. Today, we can have that hope. Today, we can have that strength. Is that your desire to have this kind of strength? Would you bow with me as I pray? Father, I thank you for this truth in Genesis that we were created in your image. Therefore, we are valuable. And secondly, we can have self-control. And so maybe there's someone who's listening, watching online, who has been thinking to him or herself, I am of, I am of no worth. Oh friend, would you remind that person that in Christ they have infinite worth? Would you remind that person that they bear your image, that they were made in your image, therefore they have eternal worth? And maybe there's someone here who's, who, who, who feels like Adam, who feels like Cain, who has lost self-control, lost dominion and rule over him or herself. Would you please give that person strength? Would Jesus be real? Maybe, will, will, would, Jesus, would you send Jesus, through the, the power of Jesus, through the, the uh, presence of the Holy Spirit to enter my friend who's listening right now, to give them the strength to rule over selfishness, and to look toward you. Thank you, Father, for the great privilege that you've given me to to, uh, speak to my Fort Collins family. And I pray a special blessing upon Pastor Daniel, his family, the leadership at the Fort Collins Church, and all the members. And we look forward to the day when you come, when there will be no more coronavirus, and we will be crowned with the crown that Christ gives us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.